Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at one of the deadliest nights in Lansing's history, where, within the space of just 12 hours, the police department were called in to three separate incidents involving three dead bodies. Lansing is the capital of the US state of Michigan and back in 1999 when this story occurred had a population of around 120,000 people. Lansing police spokesman Lieutenant Raymond Hall said, We don't want any more nights like this. None of us remember a time where we've had three unrelated homicides in the same day. The first call came in at around 6pm on Monday the 18th of October 1999. The body of 22-year-old Jamie French had been found in the basement of her home on Heathgate Drive. Just three and a half hours later, the police were called to a house on Limville Street. Upon entry, they discovered the body of 27-year-old John Fraction on his living room sofa. Then at 6am the following morning, the police were called to Lathrop Street where the body of 22-year-old Rebecca Huseman had been discovered in her car. Let's now take a look at each of these cases in turn. 22-year-old Jamie French had a new home, a new husband, and was in the early stages of pregnancy. Her husband, 31-year-old Sean French, was a promising musician. The couple already had two daughters together, aged one and two, and Jamie also had a six-year-old daughter from a previous relationship. They had married in the April of 1999 and moved into their home on Heathgate Drive a few months later. Despite the father of her oldest child, Chris Smith, saying that things were looking up for her, this could not have been further from the truth. The last time anyone heard from Jamie was on the 13th of October. As the days passed, her sister became increasingly concerned about Jamie's welfare and on the 18th of October went to Jamie's house. When the sister went inside, she found Jamie's body covered in blankets in the basement. An autopsy would later reveal that she had been strangled to death. Within hours of starting the investigation, it became clear to the police that Jamie and Sean were having serious marital problems. Neighbours reported how they would often hear shouting coming from the French's home, and this reportedly became worse after Jamie told Sean that she was pregnant with their third child. Additionally, it came to light that Sean had been recently charged with domestic assault against his wife. The police tracked down Sean to a motel in North Lansing, where he was arrested in the early hours of Tuesday morning. Sean and Jamie's two daughters were with him and were thankfully unharmed. In a matter of hours after the discovery of Jamie's body, her husband Sean was stood before an Eaton County District Judge charged with her murder. During his arraignment, he appeared to be disorientated and confused. Wearing a red and grey sweatshirt and shackled at the wrists and ankles, he stumbled into the courtroom and mumbled, My wife is sleeping. He was then held without bail. Meanwhile, a local paper courted controversy when they posted an interview with Sean's mother, who described him as a talented, gifted and versatile musician, providing details of his talent, dreams, music and bright future. She didn't talk of her son's murder charge, other than to say that the crime he was accused of committing was out of character. Meanwhile, little was printed about Jamie's life, or indeed the lives of the two other people who had been found dead shortly afterwards. On the 16th of June 2000, Sean pled guilty to murder and quietly described how he killed his pregnant wife. It was an altercation due to a situation. I grabbed her, choked her and caused her death. The prosecutors believe that Jamie's two young daughters were in the house when she was killed and may have seen their mother's body in the days after her death. Under the plea agreement he made, he would be sentenced under state sentencing guidelines for second degree murder. Second degree murder is classed as killing without premeditation and is punishable by up to life in prison. Sean's friend, Kim Bender, said that he was not an abusive person. She said something and he snapped. Sean had no intent to do that. His heart is aching because of this. 
This was in sharp contrast to Jamie's mother, Judy Barclay, who said that her daughter was extremely afraid of him. At a sentencing hearing on the 3rd of August, Sean was sent to prison for a minimum of 24 years. He apologised to Jamie's family and claimed that he isn't a monster, adding, Jamie and I were very much in love, but on a path of destruction. Jamie's mother held a picture of her daughter and said, I hope my daughter's face haunts you. We are going to be tortured for the rest of our lives. Now 55 years old, Sean has just finished serving his term at the Baraga Correctional Facility. He was paroled on the 17th of October 2023, approximately two weeks ago. Now to the second part. John Fraction was originally from Chicago and moved to Lansing in 1997. He worked at a local car wash and on Monday the 18th of October 1999, he socialised with his friends on his front porch, listening to music and having a few drinks. At half past nine that evening, he was found by the police and paramedics lying on his sofa, bleeding from a gunshot wound to his chest. He was pronounced dead at Sparrow Hospital on Michigan Avenue a short time later. His death was initially reported as being somewhat of a mystery. Whilst the police were investigating the shooting as murder, they weren't ruling out suicide or accidental death. Detectives found the gun that had been used in the shooting several blocks away inside a drainage grate. It is unclear what information brought about this discovery. However, it obviously led to the question that if this had indeed been a suicide, why would anyone have moved the gun? The autopsy confirmed that John had died from a single gunshot wound to his chest, but how this came about was still unclear. Whilst news coverage of this shooting was very sparse, on the 1st of June 2000, it was reported in the press that murder warrants had been issued for two Chicago men who were accused of murdering John. Dante Robertson and Theron Buffyman, who were both known to John, were believed to be members of a Chicago gang and were suspected of murdering John, who was also a gang member. The police had subpoenaed three women and a man and questioned them under oath in an attempt to move the case forward. Although a motive was not released, it was believed that the shooting was not a gang killing. Both Dante and Theron were arrested in early July in Chicago and subsequently charged with murder in Lansing District Court. They both maintained their innocence. After a preliminary hearing, the case against Theron was dismissed without prejudice. There was just not enough evidence to tie him to the murder, but charges could be refiled if additional evidence came to light in the future. Dante was bound over for trial. However, on the 9th of May 2001, it was reported that the charges had been reduced and Dante had pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice. It was determined that John had accidentally shot himself and Dante had panicked and moved the gun. Ingham County Prosecutor said that they were no longer investigating the case as a murder, stating that, I'm very comfortable in the knowledge that this is not a murder. My personal opinion is that this was an accident. This was a very complicated investigation because people were not telling the police the truth. And now on to the last part of the story. Rebecca Huseman was described by her family as loud, adventurous, artistic, outgoing and accepting. She had a big smile and loved to try new things. She loved acting and playing volleyball, painting and also writing poetry. She wanted to explore the Egyptian pyramids and complete a bungee jump, but her life was brutally cut short before she had the chance. Rebecca graduated from high school in the summer of 1995 and moved to Lansing with a friend shortly afterwards. She later met her fiancé and they moved into an apartment on Lathrop Street. Rebecca began working as a dancer in April 1999. She had made some extra travelling money by dancing at a club on a trip to Santa Fe, New Mexico, and decided to continue once she returned to Lansing. She enjoyed dancing, performing topless under the stage name of Aloisa at the Dream Girls Club on Pennsylvania Avenue. Her family were worried about the job and urged her to quit. Her mother, Glenna, was particularly concerned about the type of people that she would meet 
but it would appear that Rebecca got on well with both her fellow employees and patrons of the club. On Monday the 18th of October, she started work at 6pm, dancing until 2am on the Tuesday morning. All of the female employees who worked at night were accompanied to their car at the end of their shift. As the manager of Dreamgirls, Sarah Selick, said, Guys know these girls walk home with a lot of money. Rebecca was accompanied to her car by a bouncer and disc jockey before making the short journey home. Four hours later, at around 6am, Rebecca's fiancé discovered her body in her car outside their apartment. One of her feet was hanging out of the driver's side of her blue Ford Tempo, as though she was preparing to get out of the car. She had been shot in the face. No one had heard any shots or anything suspicious during the night. A murder investigation led to many theories, but nothing concrete about her death. The police were not aware of anyone at the club causing her problems and would not rule out anyone from their inquiries. Lansing Police Detective Brian Smitherman said that her murder could be as random as a case of road rage or far more complicated involving people who knew Rebecca. They just simply didn't know. And it was that unknown that continued to compound the family's pain for years after Rebecca's death. It would take until November 2005 for a significant break in the case. The police in North Carolina were searching the home of 35-year-old Drew Planton. In 2002, a 23-year-old Rayleigh woman by the name of Stephanie Bennett was sexually assaulted and strangled in her apartment. After three years of investigation, the police were convinced that Drew was responsible for Stephanie's murder. Drew had graduated from Michigan State University in 1995 and had lived in Michigan at the time of Rebecca's murder. During the search of his apartment, the police had found several documents that referenced Rebecca's murder, as well as at least 12 firearms, an extensive pornography collection, handcuffs, dozens of knives, boxes of ammunition, bows and arrows, bolt cutters, sex toys, related newspaper articles and a book titled How to Clean Anything. Later in November 2005, North Carolina officials confirmed that one of the weapons seized during the search had fired the bullet that had killed Rebecca. As the Lansing police began to finalise their investigation ready to press charges, Drew ended his life in his prison cell. In January 2006, it was reported that Rebecca's case was now closed after it was concluded that there had been enough evidence to charge Drew had he still been alive. Whilst it is as good as certain that Rebecca's killer had been found, the reason for her killing still remains a mystery. This was a horrific night for Lansing Police and eventually concluded by two murders being solved and the strange circumstances regarding an accidental death being revealed. That concludes today's case. Thanks very much for listening to that one. Please click like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. So I have a question for you. Should I bring back Petty Crime? For those of you that don't know, Petty Crime used to be the listeners or viewers pets and I would feature them at the end of a video just to try to lighten the mood after a particularly nasty case. There is a survey or poll on the community part of my YouTube page, so please go and cast your vote. Goodbye.